Sorry. I'm going to start anyway. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, today's Tuesday, August 5th at 9.04 and a half a.m., and uh, this meeting's called to order. Uh, with me to my left are Vice Chair Fran Spivey Weber, and to her left, uh, Board Member Didi Diadamo, to my right, Board Member Steve Moore. Mr. Bishop, will you introduce the staff helping today? Yes, and to my right is uh, Assistant Chief Counsel Phil Wiles, and assisting us today are Janine Townsend and Courtney Davis. What else? He wasn't talking to the mic either. There you go. All right. We're going to discuss the microphones in just a moment. Um, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our emergency procedures, they're really pretty simple. Just look for the exit sign, uh, exit nearest you. Uh, if you hear an emergency sound, it's probably what it is. Uh, pick up your stuff and we uh, proceed down the stairs uh, over to Cesar Chavez Park. Kind of over to the left is our grouping area and if you want to know when the all clear comes and come back in with us you'll hang out with us there uh, but obviously you can go wherever you want. Um, the meeting is being webcast and recorded and so the microphones are actually important if annoying. Um, so it is important. I think that one is, is, they don't have to push that one on, right? But it's really key, if you can see the difference is if you talk close to it, people can hear. So even if you all can hear me in the room, it's important. Uh, for me and for you and for my colleagues to speak close to the microphone. Uh, it's really difficult to do, which is why you'll see me getting a lapel um, thing in a moment, just because it's, it's, it's hard to do that consistently through the day. But uh, we'll, we help each other and we'll try and remind you to get closer to the mic because it is important that whatever you have to say is heard by all the people who are listening. Um, and then the last thing, please put any cell phones or electronics on silent. Uh, for the same reason and just common courtesy. All right, now we're on to the public forum section of the meeting and that's where anyone who has something to say to us uh, that is not uh, agendized uh, has a few minutes to say so. Do we have any cards? Okay, great. Ms. Marcus? Yes, sir. I have a public forum comment. Then you need to give him, them a blue card after, but oh. go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, my name is Logan Olds. I'm the General Manager for Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Authority. And I simply wanted to express gratitude and thanks for the efforts of the State Board in supporting the recycled water programs throughout the State of California. The 1% uh, loan has been particularly significant for our projects. And uh, the second thing I wanted to announce is that we have a uh, ribbon cutting ceremony on September 26th and our facility, which is 12.5 million gallons per day, will be energy neutral at that time. So we've been working on these uh, projects for a number of years. We're very excited by it. And uh, my PIO is going to kill me because I forgot to bring the flyers. But I just wanted to say thank you very much for all that you do for the state of California and for recycled water. Thank you for it. Appreciate it. I, could you send us a... Send us the flyer. <laughs> send us the flyer or a link so we know more about the project. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, the minutes from the July 15th and 16th board meeting. Move adoption. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. And, and I need to abstain from the 16th since I wasn't here. I don't know how you do that, but I know you'll figure that out. Thanks. Great. Uh, next, board member reports. Who wants to start? Sure. I'll, I, don't, I don't mind. I, uh, go ahead. Okay, real uh, quickly, on July 28th, I attended a press conference with US EPA Regional Administrator Jared Blumenfeld and Executive Officer Bruce Wolf of uh, Region 2, uh, announcing the settlement agreement with East Bay MUD, the seven satellite collection agencies uh, and environmental organizations in the Bay Area uh, to deal with the sanitary sewer overflow issue there in the East Bay. And so it's a, kind of a landmark agreement Lots been done in the last 30 years, a lot more to do, and now there's a roadmap going forward to uh, really avoid these sanitary sewer overflows to the bay. Um, something that folks have noted that they didn't know they still happened at that level, so it, it's, it's a, a worthy accomplishment. And uh, then I want to just uh, 
let folks know I did attend the July 31st, August 1st uh, Central Coast Regional Water Board meeting. And uh, at that meeting, there was a drought report from uh, liaison of uh, the water rights to the water rights division there, and each regional board has a liaison on the drought that's been um, made the point person to work with our division of water rights. Also of note, uh, Mr. Kurt Souza of a of our new division of drinking water, formerly of Department of Public Health, gave a, a detailed and informative report to the regional board about their basic functions, and it was just a great overview. Um, uh, as our regional boards and, and district offices of drinking water begin the new relationship of working more closely together. And we had a, a good overview of uh, groundwater monitoring data that's been recently collected in Central Coast. And then there was an ongoing discussion uh, looking at how to structure the notification process uh, with uh, when, when results from drinking water wells come uh, to the to the board's attention uh, and how how we go about notifying uh, domestic well owners. So it's an ongoing discussion. It's been it's going to be continued to November, and uh, folks are coming together slowly on the issue. But it's good to see the the conversations and the discussions. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over. Lawn Dude is officially introduced in Northern California. <laughs> I was uh, at a press conference this last week uh, where uh, Clear Channel uh, Outdoor has donated uh, 25 electronic billboards uh, featuring Lawn Dude. They've donated these uh, t for use, uh, joint use, by uh, the Southern California Water Committee. And Lawn Dude is telling the uh, Southern Californians that they that he doesn't like drunk lawns. And so he, he says he just drinks twice a week. So um, anyway, it's, it's quite fun. It got picked up by the Wall Street Journal and a lot of other, uh, a lot, a lot of other media. And um, they are thinking about moving to Northern California. So I thought I would get a, a, a leg up on uh, introducing all of you to Lawn Dude. Uh, I also attended a funding fair that is done by our uh, our staff and some others. Uh, it's separate from the the group funding fair that's been going on for a number of years. This is uh, in Los Angeles, and it was extremely successful. And when people were asked to raise their hands as to whether it was uh, uh, was this their first funding fair that they had attended, uh, ninety percent of the hand of the people in the room raised their hands, and there were, I'd say. Uh, 50 to 100 people. It was it was really quite impressive, and um, and so uh, it it just underscores how we really do need to get our message out, and we are getting our message out. But there are a lot of people out there to get the message that still don't have it. There was no one there from the schools, which yeah. was interesting to me. So uh, we we ha we have more to do, but our staff is really uh, on top of that. Uh, I did um, the chair's call last night, and I just wanted to remind my colleagues to make sure that their uh, calendars have the Water Quality Coordinating Committee meeting on it for October the 2nd and 3rd. That's a Thursday and a Friday. And we'll have a, a field trip uh, around groundwater and uh, stormwater uh, the afternoon before on the 1st. So I uh, just want to make sure that's on your calendar. Uh, Commissioner Sandoval and I. Uh, shared a, a, a um, speaking engagement in Southern California recently. She's commissioner for the uh, California Public Utilities Commission. And uh, I just wanted to mention her because she is starting a, um, a series, a, a proceeding on water energy and is, I think, going to finally uh, tie the, the, the knot around uh, establishing the water energy uh, rules, if you will, for, uh, for how the CPUC will operate, how the, how the power companies will operate vis-a-vis uh, -vis water uh, over the next several months. She'll be holding a, a series of hearings, and I believe, Felicia, you're going to be going to the first one, which is great. And uh, they will be, the, the CPUC will be uh, hosting, or will be, um, uh, sponsoring a resolution on the 14th of September 
that will uh, mirror what we did on conservation emergency regs. So this means that the uh, uh, the um, IOUs will uh, will be um, be asked as our as other public agencies have been asked to uh, kick in their mandatory requirements for outdoor watering. And finally, uh, I learned uh, at this last week that the plumbing code was um, amended uh, in January and for for uh, for uh, gray water as well as some LID work and so I think it would be I'm looking at John I, what I would like is that we have a, a, a presentation or a briefing on what this means and what some of the the local jurisdictions are doing to incorporate gray water and um, and these new features in, in the plumbing code and I see uh, Casco behind you, is nodding his head. He knew he knew this had happened, and so uh, maybe you can get some stakeholders to help. Thank you. We'll take care of it. That sounds great. That would be something that would be when we're ready to put on the website as well. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to start off by talking about the um, expert panel um, for uh, irrigated lands and nitrates. So uh, they have um, completed their sort of their initial round and they have a document out for public comment. Um, I attended and board member Moore also attended um, the uh, um, meeting, uh, public meeting in which they received uh, oral public comment and then um, the public comment deadline for written comments is um, August the 7th. And last week I also attended an advisory committee. So uh, Darren Polhemis, um, um, and uh, Gita led up a discussion. It's a very open process. Anyone's uh, invited to attend. It's not, you know, a, a committee, an official committee, sort of more informal. And so there was a very uh, good discussion, uh, differing views, uh, because it's, you know, all stakeholders that are part of that process. Um, but there seemed to be uh, uh, one consistent theme, and that is that the report needs to be uh, probably um, revised to be more clear. Um, uh, several uh, comments came up um, uh, in which uh, people were really not certain about um, uh, uh, what the recommendations actually meant. So um, I think that this is, you know, a useful process so that the um, uh, preparers of the report um, can be more clear uh, as to their recommendations. Um, Let's see here. I spoke um, at SEEB's Summer Issue Conference in Tahoe and um, uh, uh, focused my comments on uh, drought and curtailments, uh, talked a little bit about the upcoming water quality control plan, um, and also groundwater. And then um, uh, board member Dodick and uh, John Bishop also did a presentation um, very much focused on the same thing. So by the time we were finished, um, I think that the members of SEEB uh, had uh, a good opportunity to get updated on those issues. Um, I also spoke to the Risk Management Association. This is an um, agricultural lenders association and uh, talked with them about um, issues um, that they're concerned about that create instability in, you know, in lending, in agricultural lending. So a lot of questions about what exactly do curtailments mean. Um, and uh, drought next year, needing to plan for next year, and then also talked about uh, irrigated lands um, and groundwater, also issues that can create um, instability. So it's important for them to understand um, our regulatory approach in these issues. Um, I'm going to kind of go back because uh, we didn't have a briefing last time um, uh, uh, or a board member comment. And I did want to uh, share um, an interesting um, uh, tour that I had with the Sonoma County Water Agency. Um, and I toured uh, the Dry Creek Russian River system. And it was um, just uh, very exciting to see growers working with the water district and uh, working with the resource conservation district on um, ways to uh, create uh, river restoration and enhancement projects. Their issue, uh, interestingly enough, is a little too much flow. 
um, uh, and uh, wanting to create these habitat improvements uh, so that flows can be slowed down in order to create some additional um, rearing opportunities for the fish. Um, so, uh, and of course, those projects then also help um, adjacent landowners that are suffering from erosion um, problems. Um, board member Moore and I spent time with the um, uh, Napa County um, Grape Growers Association. There were representatives there from their groundwater committee, um, a member of the Board of Supervisors, and ha had a real good discussion about uh, what they're doing on groundwater and then also on uh, river restoration sediment control projects. We were at the um, Honig Winery and um, you know, just real exciting to see all the things that they're doing for sustainability, uh, changing sort of the, the grading of uh, the edge of the um, vineyard so that it goes toward the vineyard as opposed to toward the river. Um, and then uh, the, the week and a half ago, um, I was um, in Southern California, and I'm going to report about that next time because I was there for a whole week, and I left my props on my desk. So I'm going <laughs> to do a little show and tell of my own well, we the next time we do meet. It tomorrow before the workshop. Okay. This, for a special so this is just a preview announcement. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We need a little green screen coming up. Well, thanks. I'll just uh, for me, it's been largely. Um, drought, drought, and drought, um, issues, groundwater, and then obviously the conservation regs again, the same things that you all have been working on, but um, that sort of absorbed what I've been doing in terms of media and other things. One, one of the things I did want to note that happened in the last couple of weeks was, of course, our regs went uh, final early. Um, thank you, OAL, because it wasn't an emergency. Uh, some people weren't happy we didn't wait until the first so that they, some media would go like, if they're emergency regs and they get, the, they try and get them out early, it's emergency regs. Um, but it was also gratifying to see the PPIC poll come out that said 75% of Californians actually want mandatory water conservation at the local level. And I think combined with our regs and that poll data, I, you probably heard a lot of this when you were in Southern California, the rest of you may have, um, some agencies have really stepped up even ones that didn't want us to act, and I'm hoping that we'll have all kinds of success stories as they act, as opposed to people focusing on our uh, regulations. Um, I did a couple of uh, events and trips. I just want to mention one. Um, there was a, a training program that uh, GoBiz sponsored called Lean Sigma Six. Essentially, it's a it's a uh, training program for folks in agencies. It's kind of a reinvention training where they pick a process and figure out how to move it. We had um, uh, uh, one of our staff participate, so I went to the graduation ceremony. And it was just cool, because you just had people from agencies all over that had figured out how to look at their processes and just figure out where the pinch points were, where the delays were, and without too much work on, the, on behalf of people in a new system, figure out a way to make everything move faster. So it was sort of inspiring and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good work arts came out of the underground storage tank program and uh, our graduate was, he was just terrific. Um, the other two things I did that were interesting, I went to, uh, finally I think you've all been there, I went to the San Diego County Water Authority and sort of, uh, I've worked with them over the past few decades but I had never sat down and heard their whole story including their uh, 1991 experience where their supplies were cut in half and that that's what's driving them towards diversification um, so intensively which was interesting and I uh, toured the Carlsbad desal plant which is half done it looks like the charts we've seen but it was interesting to see the materials and the membranes and all of that and then I did also go to the city of San Diego's pure water demonstration project which is similar to the uh, Santa Clara Valley Water Agency Pure Water Project, where they're working on demonstrating over the course of months and years uh, their ability to uh, provide uh, for direct potable reuse, testing different treatment processes and over time and where and all of that. And I just thought that that was sort of a, uh, a real investment in uh, working towards figuring out what we need to do to make recycling work and give the public confidence and I think they have some funding from us and they have some funding from the Water Reuse Foundation and some of their own. It just was an impressive thoughtful team so it, if you haven't been to that 
facility or the Santa Clara Valley Water Agency one, I, I recommend it because it was um, very reassuring. And I have a piece of the membrane stuff in my office if you want to take a look. The, the other tour I went, I went on a tour with Craig and we went to McDonald Island, one of the Delta Islands. And like many of you, I have spent a lot of time in the Delta over the past few decades. But it was um, really nice to spend a concentrated amount of time with um, some folks who were farming there and just talk about the reality of farming there, both the inputs and the drainage, et cetera. And I just encourage you to go on that tour. I don't, Craig, you might not be able to be a full-time tour guide, but I do think it would be good for folks to go out. And I've already suggested to Karen and staff that some of our staff actually go out there, listen, look, and learn a little bit about how they're doing it. Of course, not every island is the same, but I just, uh, I found it helpful. So I, I recommend it. Um, all right, process for the day. Um, we have a number of uncontested items, and I'm pretty sure they won't stay uncontested, at least one of them. Two for item six. Two for item six. Two for item six. I have one that I think is pull it. I have two. Yeah, I think we should pull it. I, I assumed we would, because um, I want to talk about it, too. Um, so other than item six, we'll have uncontested items. Uh, at some point this morning, we'll take a short uh, bio break and then we'll uh, take a lunch break today at some point between 12 and 1. We have two significant public hearings today and it's always hard to know how long they're going to take um, but we want to really be able to listen carefully uh, as well as have our full attention there. So um, we will take some kind of a break depending on how the timing goes. It may be uh, shorter than an hour. I'm just letting you all know for your scheduling if you've all tried to schedule conference calls or meetings from 12 to 1. We may not have all of 12 to 1. We may start a little bit later and go a little bit later because I just have to see the flow of where we are in the, uh, in the schedule. And I'll probably try and take some kind of a short coffee break in the afternoon just so you can be aware. Um, all right, uncontested items 3, 4, 5, and 7. Do I have a motion? I'll move adoption. Oh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposition? I don't hear any. Okay, they pass. Uh, item number six. Staff. Oh, a lot of people here for the uncontested. So, uh, James Herrick from Office of Chief Counsel will be making the presentation. Good morning, James Herrick, Office of Chief Counsel. Um, this particular item is for a draft order uh, to take up on our own motion review, uh, review of waste discharge requirements for uh, growers that are part members of a third party group for the Eastern San Joaquin River watershed. Mm -hmm. um, this would, order was adopted by the Central Valley Board in uh, December 7th of 2012. Uh, we received three petitions which were consolidated. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we sent out the uh, acknowledgement letter in November of 2013 and our regs require that we adopt an order within 270 days. We unfortunately are not going to make that deadline. Um, so this draft order just takes it up on our own motion so that we have ample time to review the record and draft a water quality, potentially draft a water quality order. Well, can you, it, we've had this conversation before it, collectively on when we take things up on our own motion and the, obviously the countervailing pressure is people want to decision. We obviously have staffing issues at the time we want to be thoughtful, but just open-ended always concerns me because then I worry that it gets put on the shelf at the end of the line as opposed to really being focused on because these are important issues people want resolved. So I'd like a little more assurance about the timing on this as opposed to just punting down the road. Again, I'm sensitive to the workload. I think, uh, you know, the Office of Chief Counsel does an awesome job. I've been very, very impressed. So it's not that. It's just. Thank you. Well, I, I. If I could get all the extensions I wanted just on my own when I was in school, I'd probably still be in college. So. <laughs> uh, honestly, the only thing I can tell you, Chair Marcus, is I mean, we are working on it as diligently as possible. Um, when we sent this out, we did have to grant a five week extension to the Central Valley Board right away just to submit the administrative record itself because mm -hmm. um, it's rather cumbersome and, and large. Um, 
a lot of the pressures actually have been on technical staff also reviewing it. They have been very diligently involved with the drinking water consolidation, mm -hmm. the ag roundtables that Didi mentioned or that uh, Board Member Diadamo mentioned earlier. Um, but we are working on it as diligently as possible. Right. And how, how, remind me how many of these will be coming up from the central. Well, Valley. this this only concerns this one order, right. and we do have three petitions on that alone. Right. I'm going to have to look to Mr. Wiles. I think there's a total of ten, eight, somewhere around there. Uh, right. I'm just assuming that all will be appealed. Well, sure. So we are not at a point where we are recommending that the board take up all of the petitions related to the Central Valley Ag Program. Our expectation is that by taking up a few of them, we'll be able to oh, give okay. sufficient guidance and direction uh, to, the, to all of the regional boards in terms of their ag programs. Um, I do want to assure the board that we only bring uh, these items to the board for an own motion uh, order if we are making significant progress toward actually developing an order and if we are confident that it's going to go to the board with an order as opposed to being dismissed. So we, we don't do this lightly. Um, certainly understand the concern for an open-ended extension. Um, as, as James mentioned, we're relying on the same people who are doing all of the other ag work to, to provide technical and, and, frankly, legal support on this as well. So my best estimate is that we will have a draft order available for the board to consider uh, by the late fall. It's an estimate. Oh, and it's that's sooner than I would have thought. Okay. It's dependent upon people breaking free from their other commitments. <laughs> but it is something that we are treating as a high priority because we know it's a high priority to the board. Yeah, I may can I ask I'd sort of like a briefing on where it all is sometime in the next couple of weeks. Certainly. Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about, um, and I know that's not uh, the subject of this item, but um, the timing on the other petitions. Are we close to the um, to the deadline such that a decision would have to be made on whether or not you'd be coming to us on a, a similar request we do with respect one. to the others? Oh, for the Central Valley Ag? No, the, the, what, under our regulations, uh, the, there's a 270-day clock, which we can extend by 60 days with consensus from the, uh, the petitioners. Uh, that clock doesn't actually start ticking until we uh, deem the petition complete and ask the regional board to submit the administrative record and all of the other interested parties to submit a response to the petition. And so um, we historically have issued that letter very judiciously as a matter of sort of doing a, a triage and prioritization of the workload that we expect to do. We don't want to put people to unnecessary work uh, if, in fact, the board is going to ultimately dismiss a petition. Um, so at this point, I'm not expecting that we're going to need to do um, anything extraordinary with respect to other petitions related to the Central Valley uh, and their ag program. Uh, there are a couple of other petitions that we may end up having to come to you from different areas, different regions, different issues uh, where we may be asking for an own motion extension. I should also mention uh, that we are proposing to amend our petition regulations so that uh, essentially people have greater certain certainty sooner as to whether or not the board is going to ask for the record mm -hmm. and responses to a petition. Um, that's a, uh, a matter that we will be coming back to the board with proposed amendments to the water quality petition regulations in just the next several months. And, and then I'll just add that I had asked Michael Loeffler for a briefing as well. So, I mean, he's not here, but th just thought I'd mention it to you. Sure, we'll, we'll make sure we schedule that. Right. So just so I understand it, and I'm sorry, I know a couple of people want to speak. Um, so potentially you could have whatever, eight or nine sets of petitions. So let's, so we decide this first set, whenever we do, let's assume before the end of this year. Then you have pending petitions on some of the other ones. What, what we don't have to decide, do we then have the Central Valley Board potentially, depending on what we decide. Let's say we decide on changes mm -hmm. or something to reconsider what they did in light of what we said. What's the procedure that will sure, follow so that we're not Right. It depends repetitive. a little bit. I mean, it, uh, in the case of the Central Coast uh, Ag order that this board spent quite a bit of time and, and effort to, uh, uh, to develop, 
the, in fact, once the board issued the Central Coast Ag Order, the Central Valley Board went back and amended uh, some of their ag waivers okay. to, to be consistent with the direction that the board provided. Okay. So it's not necessary in all cases for the board to actually take up each and every petition for the regions to actually uh, follow the direction that the board gives in a single order. All right, so presumably we'll just have a chance to talk about that when we get to the... All right, I'm sorry, why other comments or questions? Okay, why don't we go to the speakers? Thank you very much. Oh, we have a few. Um, first, Phoebe Seaton with Agua. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much. Sure. Um, Phoebe Seaton on behalf of, of Agua. Um, we are pleased to, to hear the status report. We also commented in large part with concern that this was going to be an open ended. Um, uh, punt, for, for lack of a better word. Um, there are several other petitions, I think, before the regional board right now, and so we are curious to see how those will be managed. The, um, no um, the certificate of completion has been issued on those. Um, and I, we just want to remind the board that you know as well as I that this has been on all of our agendas for many, many years. And we just wanted to reiterate that further delay just digs us all a deeper hole especially the communities that are most reliant on, on contaminated water and most uh, kind of implicated and impacted by um, the failure of the order to uh, adequately protect groundwater. We are pleased with the timeline of this fall and we look forward to hearing more in the future and as noted in our comments, we're very happy to provide uh, further briefing, et cetera, if the board so wishes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Tess Dunham, East San Joaquin Valley Water Quality Coalition, on behalf of. Good morning, Tess Dunham, Legal Counsel to the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition. And uh, we are the real party in interest. We are not one of the petitioners, but it is our order that is being challenged. And I just want to make sure that, you know, and I think we do agree with, um, with Ms. Seaton that timing is important. We are working diligently, you know, obviously to implement the program as it's been adopted. When things, of course, are petitioned to you, it does not mean that things are stayed unless you agree to otherwise. And so we are in full implementation mode in order to do everything within the order on the times that it's been required. If there was a substantive major change from all of you, it would be highly disruptive uh, with respect to where we are, as well as, frankly, the, the money that's been expended. We have spent, you you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last year and a half to um, put forward a very, very um, elaborate groundwater assessment report that's now under review by the regional board and we're in discussion as to how to finalize that and to make it better to meet the regional board's needs. We have gone out, we have collected farm evaluations from all of our member growers. There's been an extensive outreach effort to bring in new people that weren't subject to the pre previous surface water program. And uh, you know, we are collecting dues from folks that are saying, what is this for? What are we doing? We have to explain to them and we have to explain all of our deliverables. So I just want to make sure that it's completely understood that all of these orders, even those that where a you know, certificate has not been provided or a, a, we call what the 30-day notice letter has been issued, that we're all in implementation mode. And so the longer it takes, the further down the road we get in our current implementation program. Yeah, that's where the speed in deciding these is helpful to all concerned. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That was a good reminder. Carrie Fisher from the California Farm Bureau Federation. Good morning, Carrie Fisher, Legal Counsel with California Farm Bureau. Just brief, uh, we support the, the staff's um, own motion review and we uh, ask that you accept that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Jennifer Spalletta, Counsel for San Joaquin County and Delta Water Quality Coalition. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I wanted to reiterate what Ms. Dunham said about uh, operating under the order. I represent another coalition, which is north of the East San Joaquin Coalition. We are a petitioner in this case, but our order has also 
um, been challenged. Mm -hmm. We are implementing, our growers are paying in excess of $5 an acre. They have all submitted their payments as of June and we have spent a lot of money mm -hmm. to implement the program and protect surface water and groundwater. But there is something else, and I think your staff will tell you this, that these issues are not easy. Right. Um, you're talking about trying to fit a 1968 policy with 2014 conditions and concerns yeah. and it's challenging and we do encourage um, the board and the staff to take the time it needs to do a good job and we appreciate the effort thank you thank you very much okay thank you all that was helpful now that we've had a little bit of a discussion questions and comments do I have a motion so moved all second okay all favor? Aye. aye okay any opposition all right, carries, but important discussion to have. All right, next we have our um, informational item on the drought. Ms. Montgomery. Hi, I'm Amanda Montgomery, and I'm the program manager for water rights permitting and licensing. And I'll provide a brief update on drought items that we're handling in the Division of Water Rights. Can I ask you a quick hydrological sure. question? Okay. I know that this weather we've been having is just taunting us with um, yes. bits of raindrops. And, but are, is there any place that any community that's actually been significantly helped by some of the Sierra little bursts of thunderstorm? Do we have any small communities whose reservoirs have recovered because of it at least? I'm sure every drop helps. But yeah, every I drop think helps. That it's that's um, true. significant. Oh. But I'll let you know if I hear yeah, there's I anyone that. I keep hoping. Okay. I hope with you. So um, we last updated you in mid July. Since that time, we have three urgency change requests that we continue to process. Okay. One is June Lake Public Utility District on oh. the eastern side of the Sierra. Okay. And then we have two new ones. One is Cambria Community Service District wow. in the Central Coast. Okay. And we also have a renewal of an urgency change from the city of Santa Cruz. So we're yeah, working on a, sure. the urgency changes allow renews, renewals for another 180 days. And you're hoping to get, or you have gotten one, or you're hoping to get one for Lake Mendocino, right? For Sonoma County Water Agency, we've been closely working with Sonoma County Water Agency and Mendocino Russian River Flood Control District. Um, they've been indicating that it's likely that a TUCP will be filed. We've heard that a draft might come in today. So. Okay, can you, can, I, I, just because so many people are on vacation, can you keep sure. me on top of that? Because I'm happy to call. On I'm that. happy I'm to do that. I'm sort of frustrated how long it's taking. I understand there are issues, but I also see the lake level dropping. So I will keep you informed. Thanks. Thanks. We also have another transfer request. We thought we were done for the season, but hmm. we got a late um, submittal. It's from U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and Contra Costa Water District. Hmm. And it will transfer water to Byron Bethany Irrigation District. As far as actions taken since we last updated you, we had to deny two requests due to curtailment. The first one was an urgency change from Hidden Valley Lake Community Service District in the Puda Creek watershed, which is curtailed. And the other was for a uh, temporary permit application for a small vacation re resort called Rentier Inc. in the Yuba River watershed. Mm -hmm. That's also curtailed. We did approve an urgency change for the city of Thousand Oaks. Oh. And we modified two urgency change orders, Montague Water Conservation District due to input from the water master, and El Dorado Irrigation District, we updated their conservation term. On curtailments on last Friday, August 1st, we lifted curtailment for the holders of 22 post-14 water rights on the main stem Eel River located downstream of the confluence with the South Fork Eel River. Hmm. Uh, within those 22 parties were the city of Rio Del, Scotia, and Fortuna. They received this notice, letting them know they were no longer curtailed due to their geographic location. This action was taken as a result of in, uh, stream flow gauge adjustments made by USGS. Oh, interesting. Sure. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any project-specific questions that you might have. On El Dorado, sure. uh, you said you changed the conservation term. H how did you change it? Sure. So on, I think it was, it was about July 10th, the deputy director for, or the uh, deputy director for the Division of Water Rights adopted a standard term for conservation for 
urgency changes and for temporary mm -hmm. permits that we adopt during the drought, where the urgency finding is because of drought. And so we have that new standard term, it's on our website. It has two options within it. One is if the party is already under a water shortage contingency plan, such as what you heard with the emergency regulations on conservation, and that plan resulted in meaningful conservation, so at least 20%, uh, that they can continue to operate under that plan for their urgency change order. However, the other option is that we have a number of plant parties that come to us for urgency changes who aren't actually urban water providers. Mm -hmm. Their water rights are used for things like irrigation or other uses. So for parties that don't have a plan or they have a use type that doesn't require a plan, they will create a, uh, one just for the purpose of the urgency change order. And it will target 20% conservation. Mm -hmm. uh, we leave it up to them to tell us how, but they have to report to us every month. And if they're not meeting 20%, they have to tell us what they'll do in the next month to meet it. So it's an adaptive approach. Yeah. And so with um, El Dorado Irrigation District, <coughs> they receive the standard term. It is interesting because their use under the urgency change order is on recycled water. And you might remember from the emergency regulations that that's not really targeting recycled water. So they're going to have a plan that says what they're going to do to have 20% conservation of recycled water. Wow. So. That's yeah. valuable. That's cool. Yeah, and that's because it was interacted with the stream flow issues mm -hmm. in the foothills there. So there was that dimension, right? Yeah. We're in the complicated era. It's a good place to be, <laughs> though. That's great. Any further questions? Please thank the team for all their really good work, but also their really hard work. I know everybody's exhausted, but it's an emergency. So thank you. Yeah, go ahead. One, uh, I, I, uh, I believe that someone has been, has contacted Department of Water Resources about the kinds of things that they're doing for the drought. We're getting our drought report from what we're doing, and I was um, pleasantly surprised uh, to, to learn what other agencies are doing. And so periodically in the drought report, uh, I ask that uh, other agencies briefly you know, bring us up to speed as to what they're doing because there's a lot going on uh, in other uh, in other venues that is is supplementary or is taking the lead on uh, on the drought. I think that's a good point, and the one of the beautiful things about it is just how well the agencies are working together as part of the overall direction, starting with the water action plan, and especially in the drought. I really I've never seen it work so well. So maybe invite Bill or. Who, you guys figure out who, what, without, I know they're all really busy, but it might no, be Diana nice periodically. Been, right. Brooks has been involved. Yeah, good. However, but it's a really impressive team. Um, it really is different from the old days, I have to say. It really is a wonderful thing to see. All right, let's move on to our important uh, public hearings. Uh, just to remind you all, we are holding these public hearings. We do not have, we will not be voting. Um, on anything today. We will be listening very intently uh, as well as reading all of your comments uh, before we have our, um, our adoption hearing. And I don't know if it's been set yet. Has it been set yet, Jonathan? Do people know when the adoption hearing is? You may have just written it on a piece of paper for me yesterday. but No, we have not set a, a final date. It depends on the, uh, the amount of comments that we get. Okay. And Terrific. The comment period ends today at noon. So That's right. That's right. All right. So first item, would you, as people, hello all. Yes. And so uh, as you said, this is a hearing to, um, to accept public comment and the close of the comment period on the water quality control plan for trash. And I have a team here who are all gathering themselves. And I think that Johanna Weston will be giving the presentation. Terrific. And thank you all for the uh, time you included, Jonathan, in going out and doing so many stakeholder meetings on this before you even proposed. I, I just think that's a good way to go, and I really appreciate how you've all done that. And, uh, and we're not done yet, but I really want to. I really want to thank you for the amount of time you took before even framing it. And we are using that model as we move forward. Really appreciate it. Okay, well, good 
Thank you and good morning, good morning, Chair Marcus and board members. I'm Johanna Weston, an environmental scientist in the Ocean Standards Unit here at the Water Board. I'll be presenting an overview of the amendments to statewide water quality control plans for trash, or shorthandedly known as the trash amendments. Just a few short weeks ago, we held a public workshop. Got to do this. We held a public workshop on July 16th where the trash amendments were first introduced to the board and the public. Just to refresh our memories, the following, staff following the staff presentation, three sets of public advisory group members presented. First, a joint presentation from Al Galita Marine Research Institute, California Coast Keeper Alliance, Heal the Bay, and Seventh Generation Advisors. Second, the American Chemistry Council, and third, CASQA. Then 14 stakeholders provided comments on the trash amendments. Some of the topics we heard from the public was to support but reduce, to support and reduce trash, but questions concerning the structure of the implementation framework, specifically specificity of monitoring and the sources of trash within and outside a municipality. Today, we're holding a public hearing to receive oral comments on the proposed trash amendments and draft staff report. Additionally, the comment period closes today at noon. As mentioned, there will be no action taken by the board at this public hearing. <laughs> now for the trash talk. Trash <laughs> is a significant pollutant throughout surface water bodies in California that negatively impacts the, surf the beneficial uses of aquatic environment, public health, and causes nuisance. Unfortunately, all of us are responsible for trash. Trash enters our surface waters through litter and dumping, either directly into the water, carried by wind, or largely via the storm drain system. While one of the most recognized pollutants, there is currently no statewide objective and statewide consistency for trash. Most of the basin plans and the ocean plan have an objective for floatable, settable, and suspended solids. That objective has led to 73 303D listings and 16 TMDLs approved by regional water boards and US EPA. The most notable is the Los Angeles River Watershed Trash TMDL. A solution that we're proposing is to reduce the trash, is to reduce trash to California surface waters in the proposed trash amendments. The amendments would be incorporated into the California Ocean Plan, the forthcoming Inland Surface Waters and Enclosed Bays and Estuaries Plan. The development of the trash amendments has been a multi-year effort with substantial input and participation with stakeholders. The trash amendments were first presented at a CEQA scoping meeting in October 2010. Following outcomes from the scoping meeting, we assembled a public advisory group composed of 10 stakeholders from across various sectors including the environmental community, industry, and stormwater permittees who met and provided feedback at six meetings from 2011 to 2013. In mid-2013, we held 14 focused stakeholder meetings across the state to gain input and feedback from various stakeholders on key policy decisions. After the focused stakeholder meetings, we took all the input into consideration to release the draft staff report and trash amendments on June 10th. And then most recently, we held the public workshop on July 16th. The proposed trash amendments are composed of six main elements. I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation going through each section. As proposed, the trash amendments would be applicable to all surface waters of the state, with the exception for waters within the jurisdiction of the Los Angeles Water Board with existing trash or debris TMDLs. These efforts have been at the forefront of trash control's efforts in the state. The proposed trash amendments establish a framework for trash control, and this would be implemented primarily through NPDES stormwater permits, specifically both the phase one and phase two MS4 permits, Caltrans permit, industrial general permit, construction general. Additional trash provisions would be implemented through waste discharge requirements and waivers of WDRs. The trash amendments propose to establish a narrative water quality objective for trash. 
where trash is defined as all improperly discarded solid material from any production, manufacturing, or processing operation, including but not limited to products, product packaging or containers constructed of plastic, steel, aluminum, glass, paper, or other synthetic or natural materials. The narrative water quality objective would be implemented through a prohibition of discharge to surface waters of the state. Additionally, there would be a prohibition of discharge for pre-production plastics, commonly known as nurdles. This would not interfere with current pre-production plastic requirements in the current IGP. There's a wide variety of control mechanisms. Treatment controls include full capture systems, which are devices that are inserted into storm drains where trash as water which capture trash as water moves through them. They range in size and cost. Institutional controls, which include a wide range of activities like street sweeping and educational programs. Regulatory source controls, which can be local product ordinances. The proposed trash amendments also allow for multi-benefit projects, such as low impact development, which allows both removal of stormwater from trash and stormwater infiltration. The trash amendments propose a framework for permitted stormwater discharges where the focus is on controlling trash in areas with high trash generation rates. Based on the lessons learned in the Los Angeles and San Francisco regions, the trash amendments focus on five priority land uses in a municipality instead of the entire municipality. Those five land uses are high density residential, industrial, commercial, mixed urban, and public transportation stations. For Caltrans, instead of focusing on all road miles, trash controls would be focused to areas defined as significant trash generating areas. The trash amendments propose a two-track approach with track one and track two to provide flexibility to permittees to design and implement the best actions to reduce the discharge of trash within their jurisdictions while taking into consideration particular site conditions, types of trash, and available resources for maintenance and operation. For MS4 Phase 1 and Phase 2 permits, Track 1 focuses on the installation and operation of full capture systems in all storm drains in the five priority land uses. The full capture systems have a set performance of capturing trash greater than 5 millimeters and a design capacity for the same flows of the corresponding storm drain. Track 2 focuses on implementing a plan of any combination of treatment controls, institution controls, and multi-benefit projects with the same performance as Track 1. As Caltrans is a linear system, the exclusive use of full capture systems might not be appropriate to implement the prohibition of discharge. Thus, Caltrans requirements are similar to Track 2 to develop and implement a plan of any controls of treatment controls, institutional controls, and multi-benefit projects. As there are multiple areas of overlap between the jurisdictions of Caltrans and Phase 1 or Phase 2, in those locations we'd like coordination in trash control efforts. Due to the size of industrial and commercial sites, it should be feasible for permittees to eliminate trash from all storm drain discharges. If, that can be, if it can be demonstrated that complying with the outright prohibition of discharge is not feasible, then a permittee would either comply through track one or track two. The proposed time schedules have been crafted to provide sufficient time for planning and compliance. Final compliance for MS4 phase one and two and Caltrans would be demonstrated within 10 years of the effective date of the first implementing permit. This cannot be any later than 15 years of the trash amendments, thus giving five years for permitting authority to imp implement a permit with trash provisions. For IGP and CGP, deadlines would be specified in the first implementing permit and they can't exceed the terms of that permit. During the scoping process, we had mixed stakeholder input and feedback on the option for time extension for regulatory source controls. This was included for board consideration to hear comments on the pros and cons of this topic. This proposed consideration includes a time extension of up to three years per permittee where a regulatory source control is eligible for one year of extra time for compliance. 
The trash amendments propose minimum monitoring and reporting requirements. Phase one and phase two permittees under track one would not have minimum monitoring requirements, instead need to report and demonstrate the functioning network of full capture systems in, an in annual reports. Caltrans in phase one and phase two permittees under track two would have a set of monitoring objectives which are intended to provide flexibility to permit writers to select the most relevant tech monitoring techniques and expectations for their respective permits. These monitoring objectives are similar to the model monitoring, mon model monitoring requirements currently existing in the ocean plan. IGP and CGP permits would not be required to monitor for trash, but they would be expected to report control measures. California's communities are currently spending nearly half a billion dollars to control trash. In accordance with the water code, staff conducted a consideration of the potential cost to comply with the proposed trash amendments. This economic consideration utilized two basic methods to estimate the incremental cost of compliance for permitted stormwater dischargers. The first method was based on the cost of compliance per capita, and the second method was based on land cover. This economic consideration estimated the incremental annual cost to comply with the requirements for the trash amendments ranged from $4 to just under $11 per year per capita for phase one permittees and from um, $7.77 to $7.91 per year per capita for phase two permittees. For IGP facilities, the estimated compliance cost is about um, $3,600 per facility. Expenditures for Caltrans are estimated to increase by $37 million for total capital costs and about $15 per year for operation and maintenance of structural controls. In the next immediate steps after the public hearing and close of comments is, the co is to consider and respond to all comments received, adjust the trash amendments and release another version of the staff report and trash amendments. Finally, we will bring the trash amendments back to the board for an adoption hearing in hopefully fall 2014. Following, if adopted, the final staff report and trash amendments would be submitted to the Office of Administrative Law and US EPA. For more information on the trash amendments and the latest and greatest versions, please see the trash website at www.waterboards.ca.gov backslash trash. And thank you for helping keeping California trash free. Thank you. Any questions before we move to public hearing? I have a couple. So um, just interested in you talking um, a little bit about waste discharge requirements. You have slides on the other um, areas, but nothing on waste discharge requirements. Sure. So um, for our waste discharge requirements, it would um, primarily be through regional board um, decision whether they whether they see an area as m like a marina or a state park really having a trash issue and needing to um, issue a waste discharge requirement specifically for trash. So is it included in um, uh, the draft uh, with respect to um, factors to consider high, you know, high priority areas similar to what you have in the other categories? So the, we don't have as uh, quite direction on the high priority areas, but we see that as, um, again, marinas or state parks, and we do have language within the amendments for um, other permitted or other non-permitted discharges that would fall under waste so discharge requirements. This would allow a regional board to identify a source of trash that isn't um, part of a municipal storm drain system. So, um, if oh. you if you've got um, if you've got an, a land use that doesn't that's adjacent to a water body, and so you have trash moving in there, as Hannah said, it might be a beach or a park where um, they need to do some different kind of controls for the trash. This would allow a regional board to identify that and to issue permits to a landowner to address that issue. Um, it is 
potentially um, a, an issue in along our uh, beaches and streams and it is included if we took this from the Los Angeles some of their later TMDLs where they had um, concerns that the storm drain system wasn't going to be adequate because um, there were other sources and it's not a requirement that a regional board issue this to every property owner next to a stream it's only where they feel that it would be a significant source mm -hmm. good okay and then the other question has to do with time extension board consideration it looks like slide wow my eyes are bad 17 Could you just explain that a little bit more? I'm, I'm not understanding up to three years versus the one year. Sure. So, um, so different regulatory source controls could be um, a carry out bag ban. And so if a city implemented that, then the regional board or the permitting authority could provide one, if they had already implemented it, they could issue one year for that specific product ban. Um, and then that would give them instead of 10 years for compliance, 11 years for compliance. But yeah. there's so it's to incentivize I, source control. I'm remembering this now. Yeah. I just when I first saw it, I wasn't the, it wasn't clicking. Okay, thank you. And, and you're asking our guidance as to whether this should be put into the into the regulation. It's not in the regulation now well it's in there but it is in there clearly designed as um, an option for consideration because we really did want to hear from all the stakeholders sure. and be able to to present their different views to the board um, and we expect to either add it or take it out or change it significantly um, prior to the public release and so are the final release um, after comment so it is we don't usually do this, but it is one of those instances where we had so many different opinions, we just really wanted to gather more information. Right. Great. Okay. Question? Sure. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation, hi Joanna, um, that we use lessons learned from the Los Angeles Water Board, for instance, uh, in coming up with a lot of the recommendations, and yet we're excluding um, areas of the Los Angeles region from the trash amendment because they're under other you know uh, control measures so I, I'd like to hear a little more about reasons to do that you know for, for at the state level you know we want to learn lessons from regional e experience and then cobble that together in a rational state approach um, but allow, you know, we don't want to undermine the progress that's made at regional level. So that we, anytime we take on a statewide issue, we're going to have this tension, I believe. So, and then maybe comment in a little more on why we would create an exclusion. But do you envision eventually removing the exclusion so that we really have more of an equitable playing field statewide to manage trash? So there's two parts to that answer. There, um, the first part is that for the LA River and Bayana Creek, their um, final compliance is um, within a year. They are at the end of their process. And they felt very strongly that um, bringing in a change into that at the, in the last um, year was not productive. And, and so we considered that and we tried to work with that. The, then there's a second part to it, which is that they have ongoing trash TMDLs that are at different stages depending on when they were adopted. And so the way the, um, the amendment is proposed is that, um, that the regional board will, uh, and staff and the board will go back and reconsider those TMDLs to see um, how to bring m them more in line with this policy um, without um, forcing that change in the policy. It, it just allows them to go through their process. They felt that they were working with their stakeholders to address the issue that was concern, which is the one of the lessons we learned is that not all land um, types or produce trash and equivalent amounts and does it make sense to uh, require 100% uh, full capture in all land uses everywhere. Um, and that was that's one of the issues that they will be looking at and how to deal with that last 10 15 percent Yeah, so in, in some ways we could say, you know, what's the management efforts in the Los Angeles region now? 
uh, more or less dovetail with the expectations of the statewide amendments, but the timelines, some of the details of the TMD implementation are a little outside of that. So there, so my last question, do you envision then, you know, as time goes by, that ultimately the Los Angeles region would just comply with the statewide plan amendments? So my expectation is that in the, um, in the LA and Byron and Creek watersheds, that um, that there will be little change to the activity that they already are essentially mm -hmm. c finished. In the other watersheds with TMDLs, they will um, be um, bringing more in line with the um, with the concepts of the policy, but probably in a slightly different way yeah. um, of doing it um, because they've been so far down that path. Um, okay. okay. Well, I, I I appreciate the discussion because it does kind of jump out at somebody who hasn't been tracking this closely and it's worth explaining and discussing I think mm -hmm. hey real quickly uh, the second question is uh, you know the economic analysis that was done which um, you know I commend staff's efforts on that that research and one of the conclusions you had there on that slide was there was a larger cost range for phase one than for phase two and obviously you know I think that bears a little more explanation on how tight the estimates are on phase two um, uh, could you explain that a little, Rafa? Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rafael Maestro. I'm an economist working at the Office of Research Planning and Performance. Uh, I conducted the, the economic analysis, and uh, we use information uh, collected by NRDC, uh, published in August 2013, uh, uh, gathering costs on compliance uh, uh, with trash controls. Uh, using that information, we identified that there are different uh, requirements or different uh, characteristics of communities that will uh, require different uh, methods of compliance uh, with different costs. And that's why we use, you know, we group these this communities uh, by size, uh, by, by population density, uh, by high density residential areas, which would be uh, uh, equivalent to the uh, priority land uses in, in the policy. Uh, based on that, we came up with this range of, of cost factors. Uh, th this is a, an average, and different communities will have different characteristics that will be unique. This is more like a macro level, statewide, uh, for the, for the uh, regulated discharge that will be impacted by the policy. So it's just maybe an artifact, to try to explain why is it so tight on phase two versus phase one, is it just an artifact of the population that was selected? It's, it's a, a smaller communities tend to have a, a less a high density residential areas compared to, to larger communities. Mm -hmm. and so that's one of the characteristics that kind of came out in the analysis, okay. Thank you. A uh, quick question about the Caltrans part of the permit. I get where Caltrans goes through an MS4 and that so they'll be cooperating on the same areas, but do they have a sense of where their high trash areas are out on the open road too? I mean, a methodology for, you know, I'm imagining that near some rest stops or high density fast food locations or whatever. So are those already identified? Exactly. So we worked with Caltrans. Um, they have a lot of trash control experience of where they think, where they're finding a lot of sources of trash. So mm -hmm. it would be areas like the rest stops, park and rides, um, freeway on and off ramps kind of by industrial and commercial facilities, so by all of those fast foods. Um, and then they'd also be conducting surveys for to hone in on more um, specific areas. Right. Where, where does public education play into these efforts? You know, like Trash Dude or something. Um, so within Track 2, there would be an education component could be brought up with um, institutional controls. And then also in stormwater permits, there's um, an education component mm -hmm. Um, already existing, okay. so municipalities could ramp those up as well. Right. Thanks. Any other questions before we hear from the public? I actually, I think that now might be a good time to just take a 10 minute break out of courtesy and then we'll start with the public testimony, three minutes each. So we'll come back, I'll be generous at 10.30. So people get coffee, go look outside, hope it's raining, catch a drop, Remember what that feels like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 